Good morning. Good morning, or perhaps I should say all aboard. <laughs> We're glad that you joined us this morning. I'm Ryan Russell. I'm the college and missions pastor here at FBC. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for worship. Uh, I would like to point you, if you're a guest, toward our the bulletin that you received when you came in. If you are a guest, we'd love for you to fill out your uh, fill out the tear out section and take it um, to the desk right outside this door when you leave. And we'd love to give you a, a gift for being here. Um, this morning. As you follow along in the service, you, you will find uh, the song titles and hymnal numbers uh, in your bulletin. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we had a, a group that returned this week from, from Manchester on a trip. Uh, we we re returned back on Monday night, and uh, I'm pleased to tell you it was a very successful trip. We were very encouraged by it. Uh, we took 10 of us, uh, mostly college students, on the trip, and we will be sharing some stories from that, uh, from that time on Wednesday the 13th uh, coming up. We hope that you will join us. But in the meantime, uh, be encouraged to know that we have uh, a great group of college, and college students who grew a lot on this trip and were very faithful and um, I'm very proud of and so uh, we're, we're very pleased uh, we invite you today to participate fully in the service um, you can follow along with your bulletin and get ready to sing and this morning as we do greet one another we'd like to try something uh, new called the passing of the peace uh, and so when you when you greet someone in a moment before you ask their name or how their kids are doing or or maybe who they've got in the NBA finals tonight um, first, uh, just uh, say to them, you know, the peace of Christ be with you, and the response is, and also with you. This may be new for some of us today, but the purpose is to remind ourselves that, that Christ is here with us as we worship this morning. So, the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Let's greet one another.
Today, as we consider the meaning of Sabbath, would you join me in this responsive reading found in your worship guide? You respond with the bold. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Sabbath day is a holy day consecrated by the Creator as a gift to creation. We are commanded to honor and preserve it. The Sabbath day is a holy day, wherein we realize that all days are God's days, and the day of rest, wherein we realize that all work is God's work, a day of peace, wherein we can realize that God is our maker and our maker too. Together, let us keep the Sabbath. Amen. I'd like to invite all the children and anyone who is helping with VBS this week, whether you're helping with registration, crafts, recreation, Bible story, songs, whatever you're helping with in VBS, come on down. Good morning, how are y'all doing? 
Um, does anything look different in the sanctuary today, or does it look completely normal like every Sunday? What do you think, Caden? The pulpit, it does look a little different today, doesn't it? No, I'm just kidding. You're right. There's all these crazy decorations on the stage behind me, and Miss Caroline Russell has done some great work on this stage. And the hallway, you may have seen the hallway. Miss Caroline did that too um, with, a, with a good team of helpers. We helped out, but she designed it all. Um, but we are so excited about VBS. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., right here in the sanctuary. It's going to be awesome. We're going to do some really cool things, learn some really awesome Bible stories um, and some awesome new songs. Um, and I'm excited that you guys are going to be there. And there are some adults up here who are going to be helping this week, adults and youth. And I'm really excited that they're helping too. So before we go, I want to say a special prayer for VBS that we have a great week and we learn all about God's love for us. Think we can do that? All right, let's pray. God, I thank you for all these precious, precious children who are here this morning um, and all the special workers and leaders who are up here um, to represent all the people who are going to be working and helping and volunteering this week, God. I pray that you be with us this week at VBS. Um, help us have a great time. But more importantly, God, help us to learn about you and your love for each and every one of us. It's in your son's precious and holy name I pray. Amen. A reading from Luke 13, 10 through 17. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she strained up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing.
Good morning. Would you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we stand together in this room, hear the word of the Lord from Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember 
that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God command you to keep the Sabbath day. Let's pray together. Our good and our holy God, we thank you for your refreshing word. We thank you that you give us light for our path, that you guide our steps. We thank you that your grace is stubborn, Lord, and when we fall, you are there to pick us up and to embrace us and to clean us and to tell us to go and sin no more with my help. God, we thank you that you are with us, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, we thank you that you speak to us, that you guide our hearts. And Lord, as we open your word together today, we come hungry and we come humbly and we come boldly asking you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, give us hearts that will receive your word like a seed planted in good soil. Give us feet that will walk quickly to do your will. God, make our hands strong that our work, our service in this world would be like your very own. And God, we pray that a word of witness would be found on our lips. This is our prayer in the powerful name of Jesus. And we pray together as a church family saying, Amen and Amen. Friends, please be seated. We are back in Deuteronomy 5 today for the second message in the teaching series fire on the mountain. Let me remind you of the scene. We have Moses preaching his final message in Moab, uh, and he's preparing the people of God to enter into the promised land. They'd been through quite a lot. Uh, God had brought them out of their their slavery. They'd sent a generation fall in the wilderness, uh, and they walked with God in that wilderness as he moved on their hearts, and he shaped them, and he formed them uh, to make them a people unto his own. And here they are, they're looking at what is to be their future. And Moses begins in chapter 5, a very, very long sermon. Now I know in about 25 minutes I'll start getting text messages that I'll read during lunchtime. You would have hated Moses at this point because he just kept going. But everything he had to say was rich and important for God's people. He was preparing them to be his people in this new season of their life. And his words of preparation are good for us as we seek to walk with the Lord here in the 21st century. Last week as we started, we recognized that it all begins with God. That God gets to be God and that's a wonderful thing for us. And he calls us to have no God beyond him. Not to form one that we would put in our pocket that we could control. And not to turn him into some type of God that we would take in vain by putting him in our pocket in pockets that we could control as if we could control the God of the Exodus and Easter. It all starts with God. And then today we move on to this wonderful life-affirming command to keep Sabbath. Joy Davidman said of the Ten Commandments in her book, Smoke on the Mountain, she said that the Decalogue raised them, that is Israel, above the trivial The trivial experience of enjoyment gave their life shape, purpose, a plan. Doesn't that just sound wonderful? For life to have shape and purpose and a plan. And these commandments, far from being life-denying municipal codes, were thrilling affirmations of life. And maybe no command is a greater affirmation of life than this command to keep the Sabbath. And some of you right now may be saying, hit the brakes, Pastor. We're not Seventh-day Baptists. I mean, this is not our deal. We're not Seventh-day Adventists. What about Sabbath keeping? Do we get to play? Do we get to think about this? How do we think about uh, following God as God calls us to keep Sabbath? Well, maybe we'll begin today with a functional definition that I'm borrowing from my friend and yours, Matt Homeyer. This is how he defines Sabbath keeping as a spiritual practice, and I think it's a good place for us to begin. He says it like this. He says that Sabbath is a dedicated day or period of time 
uh, composed of purposeful cessation of work and intentional rest for a spiritual purpose. Let me give that to you once more slowly. A dedicated day or period of time composed of purposeful cessation of work and intentional rest for a spiritual purpose. God has never gotten over the beauty of this gift. He gave it to us to empower us, to, to, to create space for us to experience Him in His fullness and in His grace. And as we walk with the Lord, we've got to come to terms. And we've got to embrace with gladness this life-affirming call to keep Sabbath. So how on earth do we do it? You are some of the busiest human beings alive. Every time I run into you, how you doing? Oh, just busy. I'll never forget running into a meeting with Chuck Treadwell, my Episcopal priest friend. I Just like you, I walked into a room and he said, how you doing, Matt? He said, oh, I'm busy. He said, if I went ahead and told you you were important, would you quit saying that? <laughs> Nothing like the stinger of a friend. <laughs> you know, we are the busiest people in the world. And it may be something that God needs to free us from so that we can be captivated by Him and the aliveness that He offers us. So today, on this corner of this city, let's wrestle with this invitation to keep Sabbath. Now, you have a hand, you have fingers, you might want to, there's five words I want you to carry home with you today. If you have a felt tip pen, you can write them on your fingers. It'll give you something to talk to the waitress at Nymphas about later on today. Just little parts of your hand. Five words I want to carry with you as we answer the question, how can we keep Sabbath? The first word you can put on your thumb, if you like, is obey. Obey. This is one of these great commandments. This is something God calls us to. And we as followers of Christ don't need to toss out the word obey and the concept of obedience as something that's mothy or dusty. Obedience can be a life-giving, liberating thing if we will run straight toward it. Calvin Miller said a number of years ago, Learn to obey. Only he who obeys a rhythm superior to his own is free. Now that's quite a countercultural understanding of freedom. We tend to think of freedom as getting to set our own clocks and calendars to decide what we will do with the minutes and moments of our days. We think freedom is total self-mastery and ability to call the shots, to be the skipper of our own ship, to be the master of our own fate. That is a foolish understanding of freedom indeed. Friends, we're at the time of the year where people are packing up the old minivan and heading down to the beach. What, do you have those years in your life where you would do that? You come back with sand between your show, shows and, and all your clothes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I read a recent piece by Rick Bragg. Rick Bragg could write about a family of possums, and I'd read it. That guy's just wonderful. But he wrote this piece about going to the beach as a kid. He said every year they'd pack up the car in North Alabama, and they'd go down to the coast to that emerald water of the Alabama Gulf Coast. It was a great family ritual. They weren't a wealthy family, but they'd save up, and this was an important part of their life. He said right before the trip, through three days, we'd start frying chickens, and we'd put them in shoe boxes. You ever fried a chicken for a trip to the beach? Uh, let's get to that. Uh, it said that we would start making big pickle jars full of sweet tea. My mom would go down to the Piggly Wiggly and buy Cheetos. It was the only time of year we got to eat Cheetos. And so we, we need Cheetos. He said, we, we planned the trip based on a map. We went to the same place every year. I don't know why we did it, but every year we pulled out the paper maps and laid them all across all across the counter, uh, and there we would chart our trip through Vinegar Bend, you know, down around Spanish Fort, through Mobile, onto the Alabama Gulf Coast. We'd plan our trip. He said, we would look at the forecast. We'd pull that out. 
And he said, and we would pray over it. <laughs> he said, because there's nothing worse than getting to the beach and it just being rained out every day. Well, well, several years ago, I went down to Galveston with some friends and we forgot to pray over the forecast. Some of those people are in this room today. It just rained every single day we were there. So we were kind of confined uh, to a beach house. Now, there are worse places to be confined, but we were confined. You no know, fish weren't biting, you couldn't go to the beach. Uh, I carried with me a sack full of books, and I read Jack London Seawolf while I was down there. You remember that old book? And, and, I, and I remember thinking, you know, the, the skipper, the, the, the guy who's running the show in the Seawolf, he speaks for so many people in our culture about a concept of freedom, about being in control. And somewhere along the line in that book, the captain steals a line from Milton and he declares to those who are around him, it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. That was his concept of freedom. To reign, to control. And it'd be better to do that in hell than to have to obey God in heaven. And that sounds so wrong to us. But we're so mesmerized by people who swagger through the world like that. And in our honest moments, sometimes we want to be just like them. Well, here's the bottom line. Nobody gets to reign in hell. Everybody's grasping and grabbing and clawing and wanting their own. And what looks like reigning is pure chaos. There is one freedom. And that's to be free through the Redeemer. Free through the one who will set us free. Free through the one who left Egyptian shackles in the dust and brought a people out. Free through God, the odd freedom that comes through obedience. Why did God call his people to things? Because he wanted them to be free. And he still wants us to be free. First word, obey. Second word, if you're going to take it with you, is imitate why do we keep the Sabbath? Because all growth in godliness comes by an imitation of God, an imitation of Christ, an imitation of the Father. Uh, uh, remember, even Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. All growth in godliness comes through imitation. And we're called to keep Sabbath to, to set aside and sanctify some time for unique and special purposes with the Lord because God himself set the pattern. Now, if you go all the way back to page 2 of the Bible, you see how this works itself out. You have this great creation story in chapter 1. God made, God spoke, and it was good. It was good. It was God spoke. It was good. God spoke. It was good. And we get to chapter 2, the, the first three verses go like this. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. You see here we have a picture of God setting the agenda and creating the rhythm and calling us to obey that. Now growing up as a kid when I heard this story I would often be puzzled by it because I thought the God I've been learning about through these wonderful teachers and on this flannel board doesn't sound like the kind of God that would get tired. So was God like us and just got beat and needed to take a nap? In the shade tree, God needed to swing in a hammock. So often we create God in our own image. One of the first stand-up comics I paid any attention to was Bobcat Goldweight. You remember Bobcat? He was hard to listen to. Bob, bah! He talked weird. He used to do this thing about, about God. Uh, remember when Oral Roberts said, if, if I don't raise a certain amount of money, God's going to take me out? Bob thought that was ridiculous. 
He said, if God needed money, he's not calling a TV preacher in Oklahoma. I remember him saying, if God needs some money, he'd call Donald Trump. <laughs> well, that, that joke's gotten even funnier. Uh, <laughs> As, as that guy got to be the, the leader of the free world and all. But here's the deal. God doesn't need a preacher in Tulsa. Nor the president of the United States. God's got it together. God's okay. And God doesn't get tired. God gave this resting part of it to us as a gift. But friends, that's not all he gave us. Because beyond just the rest he offers us, there was something about what God did to sanctify it that we, need to, that we need to run toward. What did God do on that Sabbath? What did God do? God delighted. God celebrated. God said, yes, 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 yes. It's not only about taking some time off, friends. It's about what we do with that time off. It's about the spiritual fire that is kindled when we say yes to the amen of God and we celebrate what He celebrates and we take delight in what He takes delight in. This is what we are to imitate when we imitate God in Sabbath keeping, when we imitate Christ in Sabbath keeping. This is what we imitate. Abraham Joseph Heschel wrote a classic book titled The Sabbath. And in that book, he deals with this very unique concept of sacred time and rest in the Lord. He said, after the six days of creation, what did the universe lack? And he gives us a word. Manua came the Sabbath. Came Manua, and the universe was complete. Manua, which usually is rendered rest, means here much more than withdrawal from labor and exertion, more than freedom from toil, strain, or activity of any kind. It's not a negative concept, but something real and intrinsically positive. This must have been the view of the ancient rabbis if they believed that it took a special act of creation to bring it into being, that the universe would be incomplete without it. What was created on the seventh day? Tranquility, serenity, peace, repose, flourishing, life as God would have it lived. And to this, God said, yes, yes, yes. And we are to imitate him in intentionally and regularly set aside the time he's called us to, to affirm and to worship and to wonder and to live the life that he's called us to live. That's two. Next finger. Witness. Witness. Here's the third word I want you to carry with you. Witness. Sabbath keeping in this text of scripture was an act of witness. Remember, it anticipates a people in a new phase of their life together as a covenant people. In this text, God says through Moses, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember who you were and what God has done for you. And before you think that you keep Sabbath by taking the day off to worship me, and you, you reap the labors of others because they're taking care of everything else, think again. He says, my people, listen to me, pay attention, listen to me very carefully. When you keep the Sabbath day and you enter into the wonders and the joys of it and you experience the refreshing and the renewal and the soul mending that takes place as you set aside time to be with me, let me tell you who else I want to experience this grace. everybody he said the kids the female servants the male servants the aliens and sojourners and those who aren't citizens of the community those who are here among us they get the day too he said go beyond that give the donkey a day off let the mule lay in the shade every living breathing thing 
on that day should experience the rhythms and the grace of Sabbath rest. Why? Why? Because it's a witness. It's a witness of a new people. It's a witness of a new way. It's a witness of God's restoration of his redeeming, restoring grace. It's not to be hoarded or kept to ourselves, but to be proclaimed as a light to the nations. Everybody keeps the day. God has called us to sanctify time. And we honor him when we do it. And when we sanctify time using it and experiencing it as he's called us to, we bear witness of his aliveness to other people. Walter Brueggemann writing about this, he said, Sabbath is not just a practice. It is a life choice to belong to a different humanity. God has called us to a unique concept of, of freedom and rest. And he's called us to be humans in a unique and a wonderful way. How can we do it practically? Well, one, we can recognize that time is a rich gift from God. And we can sanctify it accordingly. And we can make decisions about time in keeping with our allegiance to and lordship in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I got a good friend who has a kid who's a magnificent ball player. He got involved in traveling baseball. He was going all the place, gone all the time. Recognized after a while that his son hadn't been in church regularly in a long, long, long time. And so what did he do? Did he say, well, this is just the water we're swimming in. I'll try to make sure I have a Devo in the morning. No. He re-altered the rhythm of the family life. And he learned to play baseball in a different way. Maybe no one paid attention. I guarantee you one person did. And that was the little men that he was raising in his home. He learned in a moment that time is a gift and must be honored. And freedom is only freedom when it's walking in rhythm with the Lord. That's a small practical thing. Pretty large if you think about it. And we all have places in our life where those kind of challenges uh, confront us and where we have to make choices as to how we will order our days and which with them we will live in. The prevailing, pressuring rhythm of the common culture or the rhythm of God and His grace. And another way to witness through time and our honoring of it in keeping Sabbath is to recognize what they sure were to recognize in this by giving the sojourners and the servants and even the mules the day off that human beings, human beings aren't merely consumers and producers. Not merely creators and doers, but their beings, precious in the sight of God, created by God, redeemed by Christ, that everybody who's alive bears in them the image of God. Sabbath keeping is a witness because it reminds us that we are created in the image of God and that everybody who breathes is too. And long after people are able to be productive, they're still precious. If you want to live a radical witness in the world as it is right now, you just walk through the world believing that people are precious. Believing that people are precious. Not just in large groups or as a concept. But when every baffling, irritating version of humanity that you run into, Sabbath keeping is a witness because it reminds us that we're human beings.
So that's word number three. All right, word number four, and I'm not kicking against the third one, but word number four is work. <laughs> For Sabbath to really be blessed, then we have to have a, a godly concept and understanding of work as well. Friends, work is a blessing of God. When you read those early pages of the Bible, there was work before there was sin. There was work before there was the consequence of sin. Work was blessed by the Lord. Work is a good, good thing, but it's so powerful and so tempting to turn into something that God never called it to be. Maxwell Perkins was a man who worked alongside writer Thomas Wolfe for a number of years. Uh, they collaborated on a number of things. He did a lot of work for him. He edited for him from time to time. Uh, he wrote the introduction to Wolf's novel, Look Homeward Angel. And in that introduction, Maxwell Perkins said this, Every good thing that comes is accompanied by trouble. <laughs> Isn't that a great line about the world as it is? All the good things that God has given us have been tainted by our sinfulness including work. Work is a good thing, but friends, when it comes along, it's accompanied with trouble. And what are the accompanying troubles? Well, one, we can turn work into an idol, the rabbit's foot in our pocket that we can control, or we can be lazy. Both of those are cast aside in Scripture as we're called to serve and to work. Remember, this commandment affirms rest and Sabbath but also the sacredness of work. Six days you shall work. When we have the right perspective, we meet God in our labors. But if work is something that we control, and Sabbath is something we give to God, we won't meet God in those labors. We'll turn that work into a two-bit God not worth our time. So let's get a handle on that one. And here's the final one. Here's the last word, and that's rest. In that beautiful passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 2, where Jesus is going about with his disciples and he gets in trouble with the bureaucrats, he looks at them and he says, Sabbath was made for man, for humankind, for people, not humans for the Sabbath. Meaning Sabbath is God's precious gift to us. And the rest... The restoration, the reshaping, the remolding, the resouling that comes through Sabbath is a precious gift of God's grace. It's for the living of these days, and it is to prepare us for the good future that God is making for us. In Isaiah 14, the Sabbath is a picture of our eschatological hope of our blessed future in the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 4, Sabbath is a holy spiritual reality. There is a Sabbath rest for the people of God as we learn to find our rest in Christ. The rhythms of a Sabbath day are to prepare the home, to create the space, to anticipate, to long, to have a, to have a meal where you welcome the Sabbath. There was an old rabbi who would welcome the Sabbath with, with myrtle branches. That was a symbol of weddings the myrtles, he would welcome the Sabbath with the myrtle branches because the Sabbath was called the bride or the queen to be welcomed in a precious and a good relationship. And, and the Sabbath would be welcomed like the bride and the day would be experienced with God and it would end with a meal. Begging Sabbath to linger a little longer because they know they were going to miss her when she was gone. Sabbath, as a keeper of the Sabbath, as Christians, we, we call the Sunday the Lord's Day. So much of our observance has moved to this day because this is the day we celebrate the aliveness of Jesus. And for those of us who sanctify that time, we do it with the same longing that a faithful Jew kept that day as we prepare, as we wait, as we hunger for the intimate union that we have with our God. Christ himself calling us his bride. The Lord's day, Augustine called the eighth day because he said it stands beyond cremation, creation and is its summation and its conclusion. 
something wholly special, pointing to something wholly special to God and what he would call us to. The rest that God gives us as we sanctify that time with him stirs in our hearts a longing for heaven to meet earth. It stirs in our heart to pray the prayer of Christ that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. It stirs in us a longing to see him and to dwell with him without the shackles of our shame or our sin. To live in that place where his countenance lights the streets of the city. It stirs in us a longing for the eternity that he has put in our heart. And for that reason and so many more, that's why God calls us to an intentional, regular practice of sanctifying time, ceasing from our labors to worship and to relish and to wonder and to wait on the life that is to come even as that life breaks into our present moment, as the kingdom breaks into our now. The last word, not the last, is rest. Because beyond that word is Christ and his aliveness, the Lord of the Sabbath. So the question for us as we prepare our hearts to sing is, Are we longing to see Jesus? It's sort of a weird Christian question. But here's the deal, friends. Christianity is weird. And so this may not be a top ten ways to get wealthy or wise today. But here's the question. Do you long to see Jesus? If we are real honest, would we say... I think that would interrupt something I'd rather be doing. May that indict our hearts. And if you long to see him, do you sanctify time? Do you set it aside for him? Do you keep Sabbath? Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. As we stand and sing, may we sanctify our hearts in you as you sanctify us in your grace. Or you've called us to yourself. May we come. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, please stand. William is going to lead us in a hymn of commitment. If the Lord has led you to join this church or to confess your faith in Christ, or if you simply have needs for prayer that you'd like for us to pray with you about. We invite you to come as we sing together. Will you?
As we prepare to depart and serve the Lord, I invite you as our benediction today, would you read along with me from your order of worship as we share joy with one another. Lord, this day is a gift from you, not a burden, an expression of love, not a demand of the law. We thank you, Lord, for the rhythm of rest in our life of work. This is the day you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen.